Okay, so tonight we are in 1 Samuel. Well, actually, we're in the jungle. So welcome this evening to the jungle. Um, and you know what? It, it, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 6. So if you, but if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand, and, uh, and Mikey G will bring you a Bible so you can follow along. If not, you know, get your Bible out, open it up to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 6, and we'll, we'll, that's where we're going to pick up. So, but the jungle is where we are. It's funny, we were, I was sitting here looking at this, what is it called? A ziggurat? A ziggurat. That's the temple behind me, and I thought, I wonder if that's what Dagon's temple looked like. I'm sure it didn't. Poor Dagon. If you don't know who Dagon is, we'll, we'll pick up, and we'll talk about him just a little bit. So, Anyways, welcome. I am personally, VBS week is such an interesting challenge around here at the church building, but it is absolutely worth it, 110%. To me, this is the one, this is the, this is the, the week, even though it might be crazy around here and it might be hard to study and it might be hard to do certain tasks, it is the one uh, week that is totally worth the investment because we have children here with their hearts open to Jesus. There is nothing like it. There's absolutely nothing like it. You guys are great, don't get me wrong, but to have kids with that, I mean, we're supposed to be like them, right? We're supposed to have faith like a child. We're supposed to believe like them and have the innocence and have that faith. And they're here at the VBS week. We get that and we get to speak that into kids' lives and we also get to watch them dance and sing praises to Jesus. So this morning at our opening session, Everyone's up here dancing and singing praises, and I'm in the back crying because of how good God is, you know, and how faithful He is, and watching these little kids and hearing them sing, Jesus saves. As a if you guys have kids, I would definitely encourage you to come to Friday afternoon and watch them sing their songs, and if you don't, you might be able to sneak in the back, I don't know, but just to watch them sing their songs to Jesus and do their stuff. Anyways, all that said... VBS week, gotta love it, gotta love it, I guess, still, even if it's hard. So 1 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to pick it up in verse 13, right in the middle of, if you guys remember from last week, the return of the Ark of the Covenant. And it's, an, it's been an interesting return thus far, and to me it's absolutely amazing. I, I don't know if you guys remember, but I love the moo cows that are walking down the road, just lowing, just mooing, and I like to do the noise. So, right? And they're just, they're not enjoying it. They're walking down the road. They're not enjoying it, but they're glorifying God as they go, and I just absolutely love it. So, the ark, the return of the ark. If you remember, the ark of the covenant went from being a prize or the trophy prize of the Philistines who beat the Israelites and captured their ark. If you remember, the ark at that point was what the uh, leaders of Israel thought would be their rabbit's foot, their lucky charm, what they would bring in and have to have God come in on their side and beat the Philistines. So it was their own imagination saying, if we bring the ark of the covenant that's supposed to be in the holy of holy places in the tabernacle, not touched, God never told them to bring it. But if we bring that out, the presence of God out to battle, we have to win. And they lost. Worse than the first time. And the Philistines captured the ark. So it, and the, it was the prize of the Philistines. And so the ark went from being the prize of the Philistines to the plague of the Philistines, literally. So, and the prize would have been representing that victory over the Israelites. And if you remember what they did, they displayed the ark right up in the top room in the temple of Dagon. Just messing around. I have to, I got props. <clears throat> they, but they put the ark right in the temple of Dagon kind of as like a tribute, like this is what our God did. And they came, they went and did their party. They came back the next morning. You guys remember the story? Dagon was on his face before the ark. They went in and interrupted a worship service of their fake false god on its face before the ark of the covenant of the one true and living God, the God of the Israelites, the God that we serve. And so Dagon did that, and the second time it happened, um, Dagon lost his head, right? The second morning, 
Dagon fell down and ultimately was, he was beheaded. And then it, at that point, they started realizing this isn't a good thing. This is a bad thing. There we go. There's a good picture of him. So this is a bad thing. <clears throat> and they ended up um, with the, play, uh, the uh, ark bringing, uh, actually it wasn't the ark. It was God bringing a plague because of the ark. And really, when God brings a plague like that and brings a real hardship into your life so often, like in the lives of the Philistines, it's to get them to wake up to something. I'm God. Dagon's not God. I'm God. So it's to, to get us to wake up to the truth of God, of who God is, of where he should be and wants to be in our lives. But, so he brings this plague in. Um, and, and he brings this plague and he brings rats in, he brings tumors in, and he brings plague. Tumors, we saw the translation of the King's James was enrods, and could have been translated hemorrhoids. So that's not a good plague to have. Um, but also, it, I mean, it looks like the plague, as there's rats and uh, swelling and all these things, and people are dying from this plague. So then what happened was... Um, the, chil the Philistines said, we don't want the ark at this place anymore. The Philistines of that city said, we want to ship the ark out. So they shipped it to the next Philistine city down the road. And the next Philistine city down the road got the same thing. And they shipped it out. And pretty soon, we're, we're kind of just about to where we are now. They placed the ark out into the country. And the whole, basically, Philistinian civilization has this plague for seven months. And finally, they go, we need to get rid of the ark. Sad place to be. Instead of yielding their life to God and saying, okay, God, what do you want? I, I, I hear you loud and clear. What's going on? They say, we need God out of here. So they, get, they, get, they decide finally that we want to get <clears throat> the ark out of here. How do we do it? And that's right where we left off. They decide to send the ark back on a freshly made brand new cart that they, uh, they went ahead and made that never hauled anything. And they wanted to send it not back alone, but with a, an offering. So they, they offered the five golden tumors and the five golden rats. And then, which is very interesting, but I think it was their way of saying, well, first of all, there was five main cities of the Philistines. So it's their way of saying, God, all five of our main cities are saying, mercy, we want to give you these offerings so that you will stop. But the kicker was the test. If you guys remember from the end of last week, the test, they yoked up two milk cows that had never pulled a cart before. They locked their calves that were, I'm sure, yelling for mommy back at home. And they pointed the cows that had never been yoked. They pointed them in the brand new cart with the ark and the offerings of the Imrons and the, and the, the rats. And they pointed them in the direction of Israel and they said, if you guys remember, they tested to see if they don't, basically, if, they, if, if we send these off and the odds are they wouldn't make it to Israel and they don't make it to Israel, then it wasn't God who was trying to get a hold of us. If we send it to Israel and, and it doesn't make it, then it wasn't God. But if, it, if we send them to Israel and they go straight down the road, the 10 miles and make it back to Israel, then it was God. And that's what we're going to do. That's kind of the fleece they put out. That's how they were going to say, this is the test. If it happens the way, and it's like, if just to see if this didn't just happen to us by chance. And we talked about that a little bit last week, by chance. That just by coincidence, the tumors and the rats and the plagues that seemingly followed the ark wherever it went might have been a happenstance. Uh, just by coincidence that our God Dagon bowed before the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of Dagon. Just by coincidence that our God's head is falling off. But if the cart goes back to Israel, then it was the God of Abraham and Isaac who did it. So that's where we left off. Verse 13. Follow with me in your Bible if you got it out. It says, verse 13, Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest, in the valley, and they lifted their eyes and they saw the ark and they rejoiced to see it. So we got the people out in the field working. And I don't know if, if you have an imagination like mine, but I just have this imagination that says, you know, it's a hilly country. They see something starting to come over the hill down the road and they're probably, 
I don't know if they're paying too much attention, probably are paying more attention than they're letting on, but they're working out in the field, trying to figure out what's going on. But that would be just kind of a weird sight to see in, in that day and age or in our day and age. It kind of would be like a car with no one at the wheel just coming down the road. And I, I don't know what's going on. It, it, maybe it's a pickup truck, but it's got something in the back. And so here's this, uh, this cart, unmanned, no one steering it, Two moo cows, I like to call them moo cows, when we were kids we called them moo cows. I don't know if you call them moo cows, but anyway. Two moo cows coming down the field and they're mooing, right? Like crazy, like I don't want to be here, but I'm supposed to walk and this is what I'm doing. And, the, and so they're, they're coming down the road with a purpose and then they probably saw something shining on the back of the cart and thought to myself, or themselves, I put myself right in the story, <laughs> thought to themselves, that it, could it be? Could it be? You have to remember the way we left off last week. The whole nation is in the state of Ichabod, which means the glory is left. The whole nation is mourning so much so that the, the, the daughter or the, uh, the daughter-in-law of Eli, the, the wife of Phineas, who they all had died, she named her, her child Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. So they're in this place of hopelessness. The ark that represents the presence of God has been stolen by these, you know, heathen, pagan guys. And we don't have that. We don't have that communication. So they're in a place of real, and all of a sudden, is that the ark on this cart with coming down the road? And of course, they, they probably would have never seen it unless they saw it before the Philistines captured it because the ark, you guys know, was supposed to be in the Holy of Holies, a place where only one man went one time of year, of a year with an offering of blood for the sins of the whole nation. So it's like a serious thing that uh, no one lays eyes on, and here it comes down the road with the accompaniment of the mooing moo cows. But when they figured it out, what it is, and, and go, yep, that's it, they rejoice. And I just couldn't imagine the, the joy that they had. God's back. I mean, God is coming back into my life. What an awesome thing. God's coming back into our nation. Maybe that hopelessness was gone. <clears throat> In verse 14, And then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. And they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites uh, took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, which, uh, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on a large stone. And then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. So there in verses 14... And in verses 16, we kind of have the, the mission accomplished of the test of the Philistines to see what would happen, to see if the cart would make it all the way. So the ark goes all the way into the field of Joshua at Beth Shemesh. So it makes it, I mean, straight into where it was supposed to go, all the way to Israel. Those moo cows that wanted their kids so bad, they couldn't help but march straight down into Israel. They didn't turn around. They didn't stop and eat. They didn't lay down, take a nap. They went straight into Israel. And they stopped there at a large stone. So they made it. The mission was complete. And then the summation of that mission to the Philistines, verse 16, these five lords of the Philistines saw it and they went back. And it kind of leaves me with a question mark in the back of my mind, like, well, what did they do? And the evidence that we have says they didn't change anything. They ask God for a sign. He answers the sign loud and clear, and they go back to business as usual. You ever done that in your life? I think I've done that in my life. I think I've said, God, if you do this, and then I go, well, oh, just go on with life. May we not do that in life. May we not do that. May we, may we learn from all the aspects, all the areas that we can uh, from the word and not do this because for the Philistines, man, it's not good. But these people of Beth Shemesh, they seem to respond and do some right things at the return of the Ark of the Covenant. 
And the first thing they did right off the bat is they took two things that would have been very valuable in that day, first one being the cart, and they didn't fight over who gets the cart. I mean, and it was a brand new cart. I mean, you know, like if a brand new car rolls into town and you're like, we're going to give this to the Lord. I mean, that, there'd be some people going, wait a second. You know, this is a brand new car, and we could definitely use this for the Lord in really good ways. Lots of, lots of things to rationalize, but they don't. They take this cart that was valuable. It would have been valuable to farmers, merchants, whatever. They chop it up right there, and they make it into a wood pile, and they light it on fire, and they use the wood of the cart for this offering. And to me, these two cows that have done nothing but moo and be faithful to where God made them go get the short end of the deal. They get offered as a burnt offering so, so, but the, at the same time, if, a, if the cart represented a car coming in, the two cows represented the, a couple of tractors or something. I mean, they represented some good stuff, and also they represented some food, some milk, maybe some cheese, I don't know. But they represented value for sure. And these people of Beth Shemeth were so excited to get the ark back that they, they didn't, it seems like they didn't think twice. They offered them to the Lord. Now, another thing that they did right was when they, in their handling of the ark, if you see what happened in the handling of, of the ark, there were Levites that handled the ark. The Levites took the ark off the cart and put it on the rock. That was a good move in Beth Shemesh. And, and the, some of the commentaries I went through, a couple of them noted that this was known to be a Levitical city. Now, I don't know if you guys remember about the Levitical cities, but the Levitical cities were a thing because the Levites did not get their own territory in Israel. You know, the, the Israel got divided into the 12 tribes and they gave the lot out, the land out. It, the Levites didn't get their own. Their reward, their inheritance was what? The Lord. Their inheritance was the Lord. And so what God did was he took the Levites and he sprinkled them in cities throughout the land of Israel, six of which were the cities of refuge. If you guys remember the cities of refuge, those were cities where if you accidentally killed someone, you could flee to the city of refuge and your life wouldn't be required of you from the avenger of blood. So <clears throat> anyways, those are kind of other side rabbit trails that we could go down. We don't really want to, but God put these cities, uh, Levitical cities throughout the land of Israel <sighs> And, you know, the, be, the, be, the best picture, <laughs> pardon my stuttering, I do that every once in a while. The best picture that we get from that is Christians in the lost world. These people, their inheritance is God, their lives are different. Even though the Israelite people know about God and they're trying to follow God and they're trying to love the Lord, their inheritance still, for, for a lot of the, the most part is in the world. They're thinking in the world. They're thinking of their land. And God said, not for you, Levites. You're going to have my, your inheritance be me, but I'm going to sprinkle you throughout these, uh, the, this land so that you can be a light. And when people need ministry, they can come to these Levitical cities. So anyways, Beth Shemesh, Levitical city. The Levites took the ark. So they do what was right. The Levites handle that ark that would have been what was prescribed by the Lord in the law. And then, from what we gather in verse 15b, the men of the city continue to worship that day, and they continue by offering more offerings to the Lord. So they're really praising God. They're rejoicing that this um, ark has come back. And now, we'll look at the, the conclusion kind of their worship ceremony here, verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 it says, these are the golden tumors which the Philistines return as a trespass offering to the Lord. One for Ashad, one for Gaza, uh, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. Those are all cities of the Philistines. And verse 18, and the golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages. Then, as far as the large stone of Abel on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua, 
of Beth Shemesh. So we got this picture, all this stuff happened, like it said, the ark was returned, the worship happened, the rejoicing happened, um, the uh, offerings from the Philistines were returned, and now it, that's kind of just setting the stage for verse 19. It takes a very sad turn for the worst in verse 19. It says, Then he, a capital H, then God struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people. And the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. Whew. So it kind of goes from rejoicing and excited, excited to really heavy, really quick as all these men die. And so it's a shocker. It's, it's crazy. And obviously God is teaching the, na the nation of Israel something important, but also he's teaching us as well. As we look into, as Paul said, the Old Testament is written for our learning, that we would learn from these, these pictures in the story. So he's teaching us a lesson on holiness and on who he is here tonight. Now, the first thing that I want to mention, and this is a footnote. Maybe you have in your Bible, you got a study Bible. Maybe you have a footnote in there. But there is a few commentaries and some good manuscript evidence that's pretty convincing that's, that says that it was, in the writing, was supposed to be that it was 70 of the 50,000 men died. Although in the text it says 50,000 men and 70 men. So, and we're not exactly sure. It's 70 is still a huge number of men to die. 50,000 is just huger. It's magnanimous. Uh, it'd be more than they would have lost in the war to the Philistines. Remember, they lost 30,000 men in the battle. So we're not sure. In my personal Bible, the one I have right here, there's a footnote that says, or it could mean... He struck 70 men of the people and 50 oxen of a man. So we got a couple of interesting footnotes going on in here. Um, needless to say, a lot of men died because of something that they shouldn't have died for. And it says there that they were struck because they looked into the ark. So we get this information. We have these men looking into the ark, and I know what's going on in your, in your mind right now. Raiders of the Lost Ark at the very end, right? <laughs> ah! You know, don't look. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, and then everyone starts melting and their face melts off. No, that's not, <clears throat> that's not what we have. That was somebody's imagination. But God struck a lot of men because they looked into the ark, and so we see, <clears throat> we gain some information they were killed because of their looking into something they were not supposed to look into. These guys were not supposed to look into the ark. Now you would think, we would assume that they looked into the ark because they wanted to make sure that the articles were there. You guys remember what the articles were? Number one. What? Candlesticks. Candlesticks. The tablets. Aaron's rod that budded, and a bucket of something. Manna, there you go. So we got the jar of manna. We've got the uh, rod, Aaron's rod that budded that was in there. And then we have the two tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. And, and so these are the things that we would assume they're wanting to know if they were in there. But we know, first of all, that they weren't even supposed to touch it. There's a couple of things that, that bring us to that. Well, in Leviticus, if you remember, there was four rings put on the ark, and the rings were there for the reason of they weren't to touch the ark. They were to slide the poles through the two rings on either side of the ark, and the Levites would carry it on their shoulders, right? So they would bear the ark, but they wouldn't touch the ark, um, and if you remember the other example, it hasn't happened yet, so I don't know if you can remember it, but if you've read the Bible and are familiar with it, it's when David goes to get the ark, and man, is he excited. He's so pumped. It's really not that far from where we're at in the text. He's so pumped, but they bring, it, they bring the ark back to Bethlehem on the cart. Or it might be Bethlehem or Jerusalem. My memory's a little fuzzy. But they bring it back on the cart, and the cart hits a bump. Anybody remember what happens? The ark starts tipping. David's friend puts his hand on the ark to settle the ark, and he drops dead. 
because he's not to touch the ark because of the holiness. And in the Old Testament, it is really, really clear that there is a separation between God and man, that God is holy. God is holy, and we, my friends, are far from the holiness of God. And the only way that we are able to... Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so back to the text, or I mean back to my notes here. So they decided, though, to go ahead and look into the ark to see those three items that we talked about that I, we just remembered earlier. Each of those items reminds us of a couple of things. The jar of manna reminds us of God's provision for our lives, of God's provision for the children of Israel in the wilderness. They were out in the wilderness. They were in a desert situation. I don't know how many of you go out and survive in the desert, in a desert situation. I know those TV shows, the guys go out, they survive in the desert. I'm telling you, it's harder than like, oh, I'll eat the scorpion and I'll live for seven days. I don't know about that. Serious. I'm not sure that you can do that. I know I saw another one where this guy picked up elephant dung and like he wrung it out and he drank it. We don't have elephants, all right? In Arizona, you go to the desert, there's no elephant dung to drink from, so I don't know what you're going to find. All right? So it's a very difficult thing. Pretty, uh, presumably over there in the desert they were in, I, I'm almost 100% guaranteed they had no elephants. But the, the jar of manna also reminds us of something else. It reminds us of God's physical provision in the desert, and it reminds us of what? Israel's complaining about God's provision. They didn't want it. They're tired of manna. They wanted meat. They want something else. They're complaining. So it reminds us of a good thing that God did and a bad thing that we do, complain. And then the second one, Aaron's rod that budded, reminds us of God's spiritual provision of the priesthood. It reminds us how God made this priesthood so that we could come to him, so that we had a mediator. And of course, our mediator now is Jesus. We don't have the priesthood. But that's what it reminds us. God's faithful to provide this priesthood. And the other thing, though, that Aaron's staff specifically reminds us of is the children of Israel's rebellion against God's provision of the priesthood. And they had this thing where they said, no, we don't, Aaron, you made yourself the priest. We want to be priests. And Aaron's like, I didn't make myself do anything. All I do is answer the call of God in my life. Anyways, uh, if you guys remember, it was in Numbers chapter 17, if you want to look at it. But Moses basically collected a rod from, from the leaders of each of the 12 tribes of Israel and Aaron's rod, and they put it in the tabernacle. And the next morning when they came out, Aaron's rod had budded. It had blossomed and bloomed with flowers on it and produced ripe almonds. It had completely gone through all the stages uh, of, a tr of an almond tree that an almond tree would do. And God authenticated that this is my choice. It's not Aaron's doing, it's what I'm doing. And so he silenced that. But then, of course, there's the tablets, the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, which represent the law of God. And the law of God, it, it, first of all, is a blessing. It's an awesome thing. And for us, we have the word of God. It's an awesome thing to have the very word of God, to be able to look at what God says about things in life. Now, that's awesome. It's a huge benefit to be able to look at the word of God, to be able to hear from God, have him speak to us through his word. And so here they have this law of God. And it was a blessing to have a law of God, to know how they were supposed to live and to know what they were going to do in order to receive the blessings of God but also those very tablets represented the fact that the children of Israel could not keep the law. Why do those very tablets represent that? Because they're not the originals. Because the originals got broken. It was the most commandments ever broken at one time when Moses threw the commandments down and broke all ten at once, right? He threw them down. Why? Because the nation of Israel was in the midst of breaking like seven commandments. They were having like a drunken orgy party, made themselves an idol god and started worshiping it. All while God's presence is up on the mountain. And the crazy thing is a few days before, God spoke audibly to them and their knees were knocking and they said, Moses, we don't want God to speak to us anymore. We want you to go up and hear from God. And now a few weeks later, here they are. They're saying, Moses has taken too long. Actually, it was, we know it was more than a few weeks because Moses was up there for 40 days. 
but man, that they turned away. And so here we see these, these three things. And the reason I bring all this up is it seems to be that God is showing it's us the way of man. This is kind of like an overall view of what the relationship of God and man is. God is faithful and he remains faithful. And man, <laughs> not so much, fails fails, sins, fails over and over. And this is this example of the relationship that all God does is remain faithful and man is sinful. He's sinful in, in so much that he does, almost all that he does. And, and I remember the, the words of Paul. He even, Paul even says that our righteousness is filthy rags before God. And I, and I always chalk that up to pride. Whenever we do something good for God, we're like, yes, God, did you see that? And we have some self in there that's going, I want you to see my goodness. I want you to see, look how good I am. And we have pride that saturates our lives. And what is, separate, what is separating us from looking into the ark and seeing those three items that remind us of God's faithfulness and our sinfulness? Well, it's the lid of the ark. What's the lid of the ark called? The mercy seat. The mercy seat is what separates us from that judgment, so to speak. Separating us from those things that God would have to judge us for is the mercy seat. And what an amazing picture, and what an amazing name, the mercy seat. And what's sprinkled on top of the mercy seat? The blood of the lamb. What's separating us from the judgment of God against our sinfulness is his mercy and his blood separating us. And that's all that separates us from our judgment, for our sin, is God's mercy and his blood. And those two things equal God's love for you and God's love for me. And so we get this amazing picture that whenever we try to come to God on our own without the mercy and the blood, when those things are removed, you get death. You get justice. You get fair judgment for your sin when you come before God without the mercy and the blood. And we know that the mercy seat and the blood are both Old Testament pictures of Jesus. This is an interesting one I found in one of the commentaries I went through. The mercy seat translated into the Greek, the Hebrew mercy seat translated into the Greek, is, this, is the Greek word for propitiation which equals, the definition of propitiation equals satisfying payment. That mercy seat says there is satisfying payment between us and our sin and God. God. We can only come to him by the mercy given to us through the blood of the lamb. And that lamb is Jesus Christ. Not by any good that we've done. Not by our own spirituality. Not by the law. The law kills. And Paul said the letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, back to verse 20. We're almost done with chapter 6 here. In verse 20 it says, And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this Lord God, holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? So, I mean, their response is very, very good. It's very obvious. They, they, they immediately go, who can stand before a holy God? And of course, the answer is, no one can. None of us alone can stand before this holy God. And that's the truth. But they kind of have the right idea, but they have the wrong response. The right idea is because God is completely holy. He's completely separate. And like I said, no one, none of us can stand before him apart from the mercy and the blood of Jesus. And at this time, I already said this, but the only one who's supposed to go in before the, um, the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies is the high priest. And the Bible says, and not without blood. He needed blood for his own sin. But we have a better high priest of a better priesthood who gave himself once and for all for the sins of the world. He doesn't need to offer 
daily for his own sins, and that's Jesus, the only one. Jesus is the answer. Who can stand before the great and awesome God? The only one is Jesus. And the only time that we can stand before God is when we are standing in Christ. I mean, that's it. That's the truth of the matter. Jesus is and should always be our everything. He's made this way. He's made a way where there was no way. Ah, I love that song. He's made a way where there's no way, and I believe he's going to do it again. And their wrong response, though, to this whole scenario is, so who's going to take the ark now? It's killed a bunch of our guys. Where's it going next? Because it can't stay here. So they see this holy judgment of God, and they want to get rid of the ark, and personally, knowing what they know, I don't blame them. Um, but we see that what we need to do is see our sin, our failure before God, and instead of trying to push that out, just draw near to him, okay? So we're going to see some more of that coming up. But verse 21, so they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Jarim, saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Chapter 7, verse 1, Then the men of Kirjath Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but imagine the first night that the ark was down wherever in the living room or whatever of your house. And you know that it had just taken out either 70 or 50,000 men. You would have known exactly. And you're like, oh, I just have to sleep with this thing in my house. Cool. I don't know how you would have slept. Personally, I don't think I would have got any sleep. But here is uh, these couple of guys, Eleazar and uh, Abinadab, and they're still there <laughs> sleeping with the ark. Verse, uh, verse 2. So it was that the ark remained in Kirjath Jerim a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So we have an interesting thing happen here. From what we can gather, the ark is back in Israel. And a couple of things about the ark being back. Again, this would have been a great thing and it turned into something that was a little scary. The ark is back in Israel. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is it's back in Israel, but it's not back in Shiloh. You guys remember Shiloh? It was the place where the tabernacle was. And a lot of the commentaries I went through said, at this time, uh, through those commentaries and through some of the historians, Josephus and those guys, they say that they believe that when the Philistines killed the 30,000 and took that over, they came in and they took Shiloh out, took the tabernacle out. So they probably took out this place of worship because it's going to remain here for a, a total of about 70 years before it gets taken. And you guys know when that happens, it's when King Solomon finishes the temple and now there's a place for it. There's an actual physical building and that ark is going to go into the Holy of Holies. But the second thing <clears throat> that I wanted to mention is that they got the thing back that they most desired. Remember, they were in that place of Ichabod. They were completely devastated that the ark was gone. And now the ark is back. And the thing that they thought that they needed in their life that wasn't God didn't solve their problem. It didn't satisfy what they needed. What they needed was the presence of God in their life, which is true, and it was associated with the ark, but they thought once they got that box back, Remember the ark, God in a box. Once they get God in the box back, everything's going to be good. And for how long was it? Seven years? I just read it. Twenty. For twenty years, things still aren't going the right way. They're still mourning. They're still in a, in a bad place. And it seems like Samuel takes note of this, this word here at the end of verse 2. And all the house of Israel, they were broken, they lamented. And what does it say? After who? After the Lord. After 20 years of brokenness. Man, you know, let me just say this. I'm so thankful that God is long-suffering. When it takes somebody 20 years and he doesn't give up. And he waits. 
And he waits till they're finally done, trying on their own or done with their own life or living to please themselves or thinking that this one thing will satisfy. And he waits and he lets it play out because he knows none of it will satisfy. I automatically start thinking of Ravi Zacharias. And you guys know Ravi Zacharias? He's like an amazing, brilliant Indian man that puts me to shame like mentally. His physical fortitude or whatever you want to call it is just like, not physical, mental fortitude. It was just like, he's so razor sharp and he just thinks so quick. And he said his favorite people to witness to are professional sports players. You know why? Because they got everything they want and they're not satisfied. They're at the top of their game. They got all the money, all the girls, and they're not satisfied. And I tell them what Jesus has to offer. And he said, so many of them come. I mean, it's the same thing that we learn from King Solomon, right? In Ecclesiastes. Everything is vanity. Riches are vanity. Women is vanity. All of these things will never satisfy what God does, and then he comes to the sum of the whole thing and he says, follow God. Seek God. And when I look at a, at a, at a, at a, at a section of scripture like this in verse two, I think, man, I'm so glad God puts up with us. And he doesn't say, 20 years, eh, too late, get out of here. I've been waiting for you. And when you want to turn around and come back, here I am. And here he is, and he meets him. What an awesome thing. Verse three, then Samuel spoke, to all of the house of Israel, saying, if you return to the Lord with all your hearts and then put away the foreign gods and the asterisks from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only, he will deliver you from the hands of your Philistine enemies, from the hands of the Philistines. And so were the children of Israel. They were ready at this point. God knew it. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and they served the Lord only. Phew. It was the right time. It was the right call. It was the right season. It was the right heart. It was the right prophet. Man, I want one of these. <laughs> I want to see revival like this. I want to see repentance. Repentance like this. It was such an awesome thing. But first we need to have repentance like this in our own lives, in our own hearts, a real true repentance. So Samuel calls these children of Israel to repentance because they have that sorrow. They're ready to have this repentance to the Lord. And they repent. <laughs> he calls them to a twofold repentance, which I believe that every repentance, every genuine repentance, should be a twofold repentance like uh, Samuel calls them to here. He calls them, first of all, to repent inwardly to return to the Lord with all of their heart. Now's the time. You're, you're unsatisfied. You're broken. You're done with yourself. It's time to turn to the Lord, not with some of your heart, with all of your heart. Which brings to mind what the psalmist said when he speaks of having an undivided heart. It means you don't give him some and the other one you keep for the world. You give him all. You surrender your whole heart. And then he calls them to an outward repentance. Take some action. Put away the foreign gods that you worshipped. And then back to the inward. He calls them to prepare their hearts for the Lord. Prepare your heart for the Lord. That speaks to me. Prepare your heart for the Lord. They don't just show up at church and go, all right, God, if you want to speak, that you on the day of church or the morning or the night before or whatever, say, God, I know I'm going to come to a place where your people are and where your spirit is and where the word's being taught. Speak to my life. Move in me. I don't want to be the same. And we take that action. What it speaks to me, what it reminds me of is preparing an offering. And preparing an offering was thoughtful and it took time. I mean, you had to kill an animal. You had to clean the animal. You had to give the Lord his part. It, it was a process preparing took time, effort, intentionality. And may we be that same way as we come to worship God, as we turn our hearts to him, whether it's coming to church or whether it's spending time in the word. Often before I read the word, I say, Lord, let this coffee kick in. And Lord, let your spirit reveal to me the truth of my own heart. I don't want to read words on a page. I want your spirit to move in my life, right? And I believe this is your word 
your voice, your love letter to me. So back to that inward, he calls them, and then, I'm sorry, back to the outward. Again, one more time, he says that they would serve the Lord only. And this has the idea of exclusive service. Stop serving those false gods. Stop serving those false ideas, those things that you would put money, effort, and time into serving that aren't the one true and living God. And real quick, you might think like, I don't have too much to relate to these, these guys about their balls and their asterisks. Like I don't even, whatever. I don't have little idols in my house. I don't have a problem with turning the little idols in my house and worshiping them. Well, it's a little bit more than that, and it's a little bit closer to what our society does because it really wasn't about the little idols or the statues or whatever. And I kind of want to just really quickly remind you about these gods because the Baal, the little g-god Baal, was really the little g-god of money. So in that day and age, he was the god of like rain and agriculture, right? And in that agrarian culture where you were all farmers, you needed rain so you could get what? Profits, so you can make money. Baal was the god, really, of money, really, of profit. And when the Israelites offered incense or whatever they offered to Baal, they weren't thinking, oh, I just love you, Baal, I just love you. They were thinking, how can I get prosperity and more money in my life? And this is their motive. Sound familiar? We have that all over, man. Worshiping the, 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 the dream of the American dream or the dollar or whatever. And the same thing when they worshiped the Ashtoreth. The Ashtoreth was the goddess of fertility who was worshiped by immoral sexual acts, usually with a temple prostitution. And the image of Ashtoreth was sometimes is pictured as this lady goddess with her whole torso covered with breasts. And I know it's weird, but you're like, ah. The, the, the idea was, was uh, you know, a, a, an ungodly attraction to the sexual parts. And I say all this to make the point that when they were worshiping at the goddess of Ashtoreth, they weren't thinking, oh, I love you, this goddess of Ashtoreth. They were thinking of their own selfish sexual gratification of themselves, and so much of our society, that is what sex plays out to be, selfishness. Not the way God intended, but selfishness. And so here I say all these things to say these are two of the most worshiped and sacrificed for, monetarily, or what have you, things in our culture. So this isn't something that's like out there weird. I don't, I don't relate to that. This is like, yeah, this is for real. And where we're making sacrifices to those things, time, energy, whatever, we're bowing. We're having a divided heart. And God's calling us to an undivided heart to worship him, to bow our will to him and to know that it is truly him who satisfies. There's a guy that has a ministry that I know is a pastor from Tucson and it's called Running Light Ministries and he has a t-shirt that I have been begging him to get for years. <sighs> he never has two XL. Maybe I should just go on a big diet and I can just get one of the ones he's got. But anyways, he never has a two XL but the shirt says, better pleasure. It's a ministry reaching out to people that are addicted to pornography in our culture today. And the shirt says better pleasure because God's pleasure and satisfaction, it doesn't leave you empty and unsatisfied. It fills your cup. It's the best pleasure. It's the best pleasure. <sighs> All of the things in their culture up to this point are marking the same things that our culture does. And if you remember in the book of Judges what the title is, it is that they were doing whatever was right in their own eyes. I know I've said this so many times, but that's the day we're living in today. Whatever you think is right for you. You think you're a girl today? Fine, do it. You think you're a girl tomorrow? Fine, do it. That's okay. Whatever you think is right. It doesn't matter what science tells you or biology. Whatever you think. That is the day they were living in. 
And can I just say, our culture, their culture, they all needed to see repentant Christians like they're about to see right here in our section that start to worship God and do what God has said and live fulfilled lives according to God's word and his power and his spirit and be able to say, why does your life look full and rich? Because it is. Why is it? Because I listen to and have a relationship with God. He satisfies my soul. My sexual uh, activity relationship doesn't satisfy my soul. God satisfies my soul. My relationship with my life, my wife doesn't satisfy my soul. God satisfies. My relationship with my children is satisfying, but it does not satisfy my soul like God, only God can satisfy my soul. And the world needs to see it, that it's true. That it's true. Well, I thought I was going to finish the chapter, but we're only in, chap- we're only in verse 4. So we're going to stop here tonight. But I want to give you guys that challenge, that opportunity to have genuine repentance in your life tonight and just say, God, I want to surrender those things that I've been turning to and giving my energy to that aren't what you designed for me. I want to, I want to repent. I want to turn. They're going to do some cool stuff in a minute. They're going to confess out loud what I have done is sin and it's not what you have for my life. I think there's something to that. We need to do that. We need to be real with God. So let's all stand together and we'll pray our way out of here. Lord, I thank you for your word once again tonight. God, I thank you for the way that it ministers to us and the truth that it is, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill your people here tonight with the truth of who you are, the satisfaction, Lord. God, I pray tonight that we would be so thankful for our mercy seat, the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ. God, that your blood is what cleanses us from sin and your word says washes us whiter than the snow. God, we thank you because that's all we have to stand in on the day of judgment. And it's enough. You've made that way and it's enough. Thank you, God. And Lord, I pray that as we live this life, we would live lives fulfilled. As Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly, that we would be the living example of what a life is with Christ in the center. Lord, I thank you. I pray you bless your people as they go out, Lord. Give them a great day. Give them a great week. Help us. God, energize your servants tomorrow for VBS. Lord, that they'd come in here just bright-eyed, bushy-tailed more than anything, full of the Holy Spirit, ready to lead little kids to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys. Have a good evening.